Welcome back to Magic Spiral. I'm Landon Balk. It's time we talk about how and why I used a cassette-based format as part of the recording process in the production of an album. Let's check it out. I was lucky to find a Tascam 688 MIDI studio on Craigslist. I replaced a perished belt and started using the machine to record a number of songs that began turning into an album, called Morbid Euphoria. Nearly halfway through the project, I obtained a 24-channel mixer, which was more equipped to accommodate an expanding MIDI rig. I decided to sell the 688 and replaced it with the rack-mountable cousin called the 238 Sync Cassette, then continued production on the album. I bought the 238 on eBay, and when it arrived, I plugged it in and... It didn't work. It made a loud noise when powered on, and it played tapes back way too fast. Turns out these machines suffer from a common issue called the runaway or flyaway capstan. The seller refunded me half the price, and I shipped her off to a tech in New York and had the problem resolved. Off to a rough start, but once the 238 came back, it worked like a champ. This machine sounds great. It's surprisingly clean for a cassette recorder, especially considering how they managed to fit eight tracks onto such a narrow space. I was going to mention something here about the ground noise that happened when I plugged in the remote, but when I tested it out to demonstrate it for this video, it worked fine. Yeah, this remote is pretty cool. I love the aesthetics of the LED meters and the spinning tape reels. Much of my youth was spent sitting in front of a stereo cassette deck dubbing tapes, so this feels like a natural evolution for me. Now, instead of making mixtapes, I'm recording my own original music. Oh man, what happened? Oh, this tape must be broken. We are working with only 8 tracks on this machine, so most of the mixing is done during tracking. Planning ahead, committing to decisions, and living with mistakes are standard practice in this environment. This is a challenging process that requires a great deal of skill development. The limitations are a breeding ground for creativity and discovery. I don't want to spend time second-guessing myself after the fact. I want to capture everything the best I can with what I have in that moment. Tape is less forgiving, but ultimately more rewarding than digital recording. The performance you put in is what you get back, imperfections and all. The process you go through results in the sound you end up with. Before I begin a project, I generally like to choose a dedicated tape length and type for consistency, but it didn't really work out like that this time. The backing tracks were recorded on three different cassettes. The 238 is equipped with DBX noise reduction, which I used on the tapes recorded for this album. Tape 1 is a Type 4 cassette with 110 minute length. The manual recommends not using tapes longer than 90 minutes because it's thinner tape stock. I broke this rule because I was experimenting with Type 4 formulation and that's the length of tape I was given. It was incidental for those songs to end up on that tape because that's what was in the machine when I was ready to record, so I left it in. The issue I had were a few audio dropouts, but nothing major. I noticed this tape doesn't record as hot as the Type 2 cassettes that this machine is biased for. The other two tapes were just that, Type 2, one a 60 and the other a 90. The tapes include a number of tracks recorded during these sessions that would not make the final album. The writing for Morbid Euphoria happened in many ways, but the order of operation was the same for each song. It starts with a MIDI sequence, programmed using MPCs and various synthesizers. I make sure the levels are correct because I am pre-mixing and consolidating everything to a stereo track, including drums. This means I can't separate, say, the kick later. The MIDI sequence generally takes up six tracks, leaving two open for overdubs, usually a bass, acoustic, or electric guitar.
Once the tracks are filled on the tape, I play it back and record the individual tracks into Logic Pro. I use the Scarlett 18i20 audio interface. Everything is routed through the mixer. This is recorded wild into Logic without using a MIDI or SEMPTI timecode, because the rhythm tracks are already there for me, and from here I don't intend to use a grid. The backing tracks are all cut to tape. Once they're recorded into Logic, then vocals and additional overdubs are added, one track at a time. Further mixing is done to the tape tracks in Logic. So we're going to demonstrate this with a song called Get Gnarly. If we look at the session here, we can see that there are 24 tracks, but in fact only 6 of those tracks came from the tape. If I open up the mixer and highlight the first 6 tracks, we can see that inputs 1 through 8 are selected because 2 of the tracks are stereo. This particular song was written around a figure I made as a joke using a preset on the Korg Minilog, and that would sound like this. So the MPC-1000 here is supplying the drums. So the MPC-1000 is also sequencing the Minilog and this bass synth, and that would sound like this. So that would have been the sequence I came up with, and then I started adding live guitar, and a bass. Oh, there's the uh, dreaded system overload that I often got while working with these sessions on the computer. So here would be the tremolo guitar with the bass. And we'll highlight another part of the song too. That would have been played live, but I also added a piano part that was played with the Proteus 2000, and that sounds like this. Bring everything in. And that's what would have been recorded to tape. Once those backing tracks were recorded into Logic, I now had the ability to add additional instruments and vocals. And one reason I really like Logic is the ability to comp takes so easily, which was really helpful for vocals. And no, I'm not afraid to admit that I did quite a bit of vocal comping. So that's what a pretty standard session in Logic would look like. I prefer recording this way simply because I love the process. In a sense, it forces me to follow my inspiration and trust my intuition. It's a language and a craft I want to master. Tape is not only the capture medium, but a complete method to serve the process. Does tape magically glue the tracks together? Does the warmth and saturation make for better sounding recordings? Does it matter? There are those who work differently and for good reason. Not every music or production style requires such a demanding workflow. The analog realm can be time-consuming and cumbersome to work with, and frankly, this is unnecessary in today's digital recording domain. But some of us like it that way because it can be a rewarding experience. It's why I choose to use both mediums for my projects. It's best to follow through with whatever process gets you there. So what about you? Do you like to stay with a comfortable workflow in the studio, or do you like to keep it fresh with new challenges? Morbid Euphoria is the result of the process we went through here. If you like the music you've heard in this video, you can support the channel by streaming or downloading Morbid Euphoria on the platform of your choice. A limited cassette pressing is available now, link in the description. In the next video, I'm going to discuss how and why I'm releasing Morbid Euphoria on cassette. Until then, record what you want, the way you want.
I'm Landon with Magic Spiral Productions, and happy recording.